Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special 5x15 event with Kate Humble and Helen Rebanks. We're so delighted to have these fantastic speakers with us this evening to reflect on home and what it means to create happy and healthy spaces for ourselves and for our families, which is also the theme of their wonderful new books. Kate Humble is a writer, smallholder, campaigner, and one of the UK TV's best known presenters. The author of numerous highly acclaimed books, Kate has inspired many readers with her positive and purposeful approach to life, whether it's reconnecting with nature or changing our lifestyles. Now in her new book, Where the Hearth Is, Stories of Home, she turns her attention to life indoors. Helen Rebanks joins us this evening to talk about her debut book, The Farmer's Wife, which explores the work she and her family do as a tight-knit team, making their farm globally important with their farming innovations. They advise internationally and host events regularly at the farm to share their expertise and encourage others to farm sustainably. Both of these wonderful books are on sale this evening from Ewan Bookshop our independent book selling partner, and all the details about how to order will be posted in the chat as usual. Kate and Helen will be in conversation this evening with the brilliant host, literary critic and journalist, Alex Clark. Remember that we'll have time towards the end of the session for your questions. So please do post any of the questions you have for Helen and Kate in the Zoom Q&A box at any time during the event and we'll get to as many as we can. Without any further ado, Alex, over to you. Jack, thank you so much. I'm just delighted to be here uh, with all of you out in the audience. I'm going to say, first of all, um, just send us questions whenever something occurs to you. We will. We don't have to wait for the formality of a Q&A at the end. We will get to them throughout um, as they occur to you. And I'm sure that my wonderful guests will answer anything. Now, it's it's a kind of miracle that they're here. I know from our brief sort of saying hello just before, but, but Kate, you've been wrangling with vets or rather lack of vets. And Helen, yeah. you've been getting vast vats of macaroni cheese on the table for your, your very, very hungry family. And so it's like, the books make it very obvious. There's never a quiet minute, is there, for either of you? I think- No, I'm, not really. Helen. I think Helen takes the award, though. I mean, I just have, you know, dogs and pigs and a husband and some badly behaved hens to deal with. Helen has all that, plus 500 cows, plus four children, um, plus, right. you know, a worldwide reputation to, 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 to deal with. And she looks beautiful. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> Um, that's really kind of you, Kate, to say, honestly, uh, it's, it's, it was a quick dash to get organised um, this evening, but um, no, we're very much a team effort, like uh, Jack's brilliant introduction before on the farm, everybody pitches in with something, so um, it's not all down on me to sort everything out all the time, we're all pulling together, um, and it's busy and it's fun, and it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. But it's, it's and you never know what's coming the next day. We were just talking about storms last week. You just, you know, the weather can hit you. Anything can hit you. Something breaking, something carving or picking or sheeping or lambing. That's the word. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the farmer. I don't know if anybody can tell out there. However, I do have a field and I've really got to exercise great self-control not to ask you both what I should do with it. I might allow myself, I might indulge myself a bit. But listen, I wanted to start really by asking you both just to give a little sort of explanation, each of you in turn, uh, 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 what your books are. And I wanted to say, I suppose, it's a confession really that we've seen just before as, as everybody was joining, beautiful, beautiful covers, but they have things like, you know, lovely dogs relaxing in front of fires wonderful bouquets of wildflowers and for the brief minute before I dived into these these books I did think are they going to be that kind of rather wholesome rather how to arrange your fruit artfully to look gorgeous I mean what I believe is called cottage core but this sort of very bucolic vision of the countryside life I hadn't anticipated in different ways and in both your books how how honest you would be and how open about the difficulties that crop up in both your lives and Kate, in your story, all the other stories that you tell, would you just, just tell us a little bit about the book? 
Yeah, so well, I'm going to start actually, if I may, um, to talk a little bit about the cover that um, that Alex um, very beautifully described, which I can take no credit for, um, but it was actually designed by one of the people that I interviewed for this book, uh, a wonderful woman called Melanie Lewis, and the 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 kind of genesis of this book, if you like, was um, that I've had this long held. Uh, dream of building a house which is slightly ludicrous because I'm not even capable of putting up a shelf straight but anyway well you know I'll deal with the kind of practicalities of that when it when it comes to it but one of the things that I uh, realized is that uh, a house doesn't automatically become a home. I lived in a house, uh, the last house I lived in in London before I moved to Wales, um, we bought as a wreck and did up and I thought it was gonna be perfect. And it was never home, it never felt like home. So this threw up this question of actually, what is what is the essence? What is the thing that makes you walk into somewhere and it may not be grand and it may not even be a building it might be a it might be a caravan it might be a camper van um but that might feel like home in the way that a castle doesn't um so what is it what is that that unquantifiable unknowable something that makes you feel like you belong as I put it in my rather common badly brought up way uh where you feel you can eat peanut butter out of a jar with your finger and no one cares that for me is home. Um, Helen's going to be horrified because I'm now going to be encouraging her children to do exactly that. Um, but so this really, the book was a search for home. And um, as you rightly said, Alex, I did at first think, am I going to be kind of trying to find out what makes a home and then and then passing on that information to other people. But what I realized as I started interviewing all these incredibly generous spirited people who invited me over their thresholds, which is quite a thing, you know, it's, it's it is such a place of privacy and of and and of and it's so personal your home that to invite a stranger in is I now realize a very, very big deal indeed. And um and their stories really told the story. It didn't need me to kind of, you know, pseudo psychoanalyze what makes a home. I think each of these people in their own ways with their own unique perspectives gave me an extraordinarily rich overview of that essential, glorious quality that we all, that we all seek. And, and that we, can actually, as you point out, transport from place to place. And several of the people uh, either do out of necessity or, or out of choice. And yeah. home is something you can take with you. Um, Helen, coming on to your book, what struck me was it could almost be a sort of story of false starts in a way that you're pursuing something, you and your husband, James, you meet when you're really quite young uh, and you're mm -hmm. together you know, very firmly ever since, even through difficulties and when you might be just shouting at each other, but you have dreams. They're not that easy to realise. And it's a, a rocky road that you describe. Yes, very much so, Alex. It's it's the just the truth of, of real life, of trying to get to a farm and trying to realise a dream. Um, That's essentially what my story our story is and my cover and go back a, a slight step was is my kitchen table so that is literally looking out of my window every day and all the different things that um a brilliant artist called Eleanor Crow designed the front cover and did the illustrations throughout the book and you know we we discussed what elements were on and out, my youngest son Tom wanted more dinosaurs um just to, to sort of give a, an example of how my day goes, really. It's it's essentially one day through the book mm. and, and then dips back into memoir pieces with recipes woven through because the stories are all around food. My life is very much around food and feeding everybody. And that centers from the kitchen, which is, you know, the, the cooker and the table, the kitchen table. So everything comes from there. And that table came with us from 
our very first flat when we um, moved away from both family farms and we lived in Oxford and we bought this table. So I've described a scene where we go and pick this up from a furniture store and it's hanging out the back of the the VW Golf with Baylor twine tied up to hold the car, you know, the boots from blowing up. And um, we brought this into a basement flat, this table. And then it was, for me, that was home to initially to, to make this flat into a home by having a table we could eat around. And we went on various different sort of paths of doing up properties and trying to, just to hold things together together really like working hard to kind of realize like you say the dream of holding on to this old fell farm in the lake district um and through writing the the recipes the stories i've been able to explore the choices i've made along the way and what looks like a very traditional life and very um sort of old fashioned life and and how I reckon with that in the modern world, really, um, through the stories and the scenes of the book. And I'm just, I, I was quite amused to read a little review earlier on today. And and this, this person's written, this is no Argus saga. Helen has passionate views on wider issues about food and farming, foot and mouth devastation, the cheap food that we have. And then some vegans may change their mind about food after reading <laughs> the messages about sustainability, but ultimately they've put that it's a story about courage and love. And I think that sums it up really well. Um, it's always hard to talk about your own work. I find that really hard. So, I was, <laughs> I was, so it, it's um, your first book, isn't it? And of course your husband, James, yeah. you know, has written uh, you know, quite extensively about his life as a farmer and to great acclaim. And I wonder how it how it felt to you to become a writer. I know he encouraged you enormously throughout, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, he he's believed in me as much as I've believed in him over the years. And uh, I was ready to do a creative project of my own. Um, a lot of this started through lockdown where we all had longer days. We seem to, our days seem so much shorter now. <laughs> So right. Uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> and I'm not being a farmer myself, but living in the middle of, of farms, surrounded by farms. One of the things I found mm. about lockdown was yes, there was a kind of lovely peace to an extent, even though this tremendous backdrop of anxiety and knowing that you uncertainty, knowing that people were going through terrible things. But it also struck me that daily life, in a way, hadn't changed in my immediate environment because animals still had to be fed and fields had to be watered and ploughed and sown and actually tractors going up and down it it was the same and and that was a continuation wasn't it you both must have found that um Kate I mean it was obviously with your tv work it was very 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 different but your your home life must have been similar in some ways well oddly um the home life you're absolutely right home life was pretty much exactly the same and I think that was the great privilege that I think all three of us have we live in the countryside mm -hmm. and um and and particularly if you, you know so so you didn't I don't think we probably felt the constraints and the confinement that that other people did because even if you can just walk outside and look at a space even if you can't go very far that is something I suspect we all feel is the kind of uh the, the the kind of root of happiness that that idea of I mean I I know when I go to a city and all I can see out of a win window is another is other buildings and concrete it it I kind of feel myself shriveling up if I can look at something green um I feel kind of alive again so I think that was one of the great uh privileges I felt of having lockdown in the countryside um and yes having animals they did still need feedings um you know all there were a lot of aspects of life that really didn't change at all but where I uh, lucked out particularly um, is that I married very well um, I married an award-winning director and cameraman he wasn't when I married him I didn't marry him just for his skills but they they came you train him up is that what you're I, saying 
<laughs> he did it himself, but I took full advantage. Um, and um, and so actually, you know, lockdown was a time when lots of people were watching telly and no one could make it. And um, so we were asked, you know, we were kind of in this incredibly privileged position of, uh, you know, I can talk and be on the telly he can make telly and we have a farm which people you know that that sort of thing that as you were saying this sort of slightly I mean it, it can come across as bucolic and idealistic um Helen knows only too well that that's not always the case but nonetheless it there's a lot of natural drama and jeopardy and um and 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 things that make you want to watch you know that a farm is a story it is a story that tells itself day after day and so actually I've never been so busy with tv work as I was during lockdown um Helen that's true isn't it that story that keeps telling itself day after day there's oh, yes. interesting, interesting material in your book, interesting descriptions of the time before you had managed to get back to that life, back to the life that you both really wanted, which was also to do with being free of the constrictions of other people, not working for other people, not having the law laid down to you about how you spent each and every day. When you were sort of city Helen, and when you were, I think, art Helen, you know, your earlier interest in, in making and doing and, and creative projects, it, it seems almost as if you felt there were these different sides to yourself that you were struggling to reconcile and it took you a kind of a while to, to, to find that way to do so. Is that is that accurate? I think that's accurate. To, yes, I do think that's accurate to say, Alex. I, I grew up wanting to make things and create things and interested in books and music and art. And I didn't really value the farm life for what it was then in my eyes, um, for what it is now. I've come sort of full circle and moved away from it and then came back to it with probably as much passion or as more, you know, for where we live and what we do as James has now. Mm. Um, and it, it, yeah, there's this different parts of me. Part of it was writing this book was to satisfy that creativity urge in, in me to get to do something where I was kind of working through ideas and to create a narrative out of your life um, is really challenging and interesting. And um, it, it makes you go back to certain points of your life and think about it deeply. Um, and wonder why bits have influenced you. Um, and I'm really, really pleased that I've got to the stage I can hold it in my hands, but I'm almost missing that time of writing it. The, the flow where you could come up to the desk and put the cup of tea or coffee down and you'd be working away on the scene. And then that sort of, you lose yourself in that work and get that flow. Um, and the tea and coffee would go cold by the, if I was having a good writing session. I, I sort of miss that at the moment. Um, that's why yeah, you have it, to write another book. I mean, that's how, well, that's how they, they hook you in. I mean, you know, you, Kate, you've, you've written several books. And of course, you know, writing a book, publishing a book is collaborative, you know, in the, in the wider sense. But it's nothing like the day-to-day -day collaboration that you need if you're working in television. Or indeed, if I mean, it is far, far more solitary, at least at the moment, of actually getting the words on the page, isn't it? Do you um, do you find that absolutely essential to your life? Complete. I mean, it is. It is. It's a very and it's it's really interesting, Helen, that you should say that you're sort of missing it because there's this odd thing. It's one of those things um, that is it's sort of oddly addictive because, as Helen described, you know, when you're having a good writing day, there's nothing better and the time just goes and you you disappear into your into your into the story that you're trying to tell. When you're having a bad mm -hmm. writing day, you know, you sit there thinking, I don't know any words. Um, why is anyone going to be interested in this? Why is anybody going to care? It's all complete rubbish. I don't know. I should just be mucking out the pigs. Oh, so yeah. It, it and... swings. Oh, it's it terrible. absolutely I mean, swings wildly. It I does. Can completely, mate. It totally swings wildly. I get that 
Absolutely. And then I would just go and do a heap of washing or I would just go and procrastinate, do absolutely anything else but sit at the desk and work on it. Yeah. Um, but then I would have a conversation and then that would release sort of like what was in my mind about what I was trying to achieve. Or we'd read, we read bits out to each other when we're working on things. And that's, um, you know, really useful when you can hear your own words back. Yeah, yeah. I, I read. So I do a lot in longhand um, and I read everything, not to anybody. Well, even the dogs actually got bored of me in the, in the end and, and <laughs> left the room. But but I read everything out loud because it's the only way you feel you can tell whether you've overused a word or, you know, whether a sentence actually flows properly and all that sort of thing. So I do a lot mm. of marching up and down. So basically, although I didn't with this book, with previous books, I have actually left home and abandoned everybody and everything for like a month and uh and and I basically go to somewhere where no one can get at me yes. <laughs> and sort of grow a beard and you know if I wake up at two o'clock in the morning with sudden inspiration I can get up without worrying I'm disturbing Ludo and I can just go and and sometimes I literally don't sleep for a week and just write and and, and, and go completely mad um and when I was writing a year of living simply that's what happened to somebody phoned me and said you it, it was something about you know a, something that had to happen on a Friday and I was like yeah but it's only Tuesday and they went no it is Friday now and it's supposed to be I was like, it can't and I'd lost I don't know where those four days have gone but I've just lost them but That's one thing I, I really wanted to say Helen about your book which I confess and I confessed to you earlier that I haven't read all of it yet but it's it is so much more, it's so much more complex than just your life because you throw up some really, really interesting themes that I think, you know, as a, as a woman, it's sort of, yes, the farming side of it is, is fascinating and illuminating, yeah. but actually it really throws into, into sharp focus the role of women in any home. And I love, if I'm, I'm going to just read the quote that you use at the beginning, because it really made me think, you know, it really made me think. Um, and it's a quote from, um, from Middlemarch, George Eliot's Middlemarch. Um, and it is, but the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs and i thought my goodness that is you know there are so many women that i've met through the farming community around me that are the absolute linchpin of their families and of the businesses and of everything else. And it is sort of expected um, and they are unsung and they don't ask for medals, but I think you just highlight it through the stories of your, your grandmother and your mother, you know, the role of women in, in, in society and, and and how crucial you are as homemakers, as we are as homemakers. I'm really, really delighted you you said that, Kate. And, and thank you very much. I also was so it was so lovely to see that George Eliot quote, and the bit I scribbled down particularly was unhistoric acts. That's what you do day by day. It's the accumulation of unhistoric acts that actually make our lives go on. But but you mentioned there Helen's mother and her grandmother and. I was very moved, Helen, by how, how confidently, even though some of it must have been quite painful, you dealt with the difficulties that you had in your relationship with your mother, your mother had in her relationship with hers. And you as a young woman growing up feeling, as, as we all do sometimes, patient with your mother for, you know, telling you what to do, not getting a nice dinner on the table, always seeing seeming harassed and exhausted and there's a whole backstory there isn't there I wonder just tell us about writing that aspect of the book gosh yes there is a whole backstory there um mum didn't come from a farming background um she had some connection with it with her her aunts she went to uh look at look stay with them 
on the weekends and in the holidays. And, and then the very first piece I wrote was making marmalade. And um, it became, it wasn't a, a thing where I was trying to understand how to make marmalade as a little girl. It was, I was writing that and I was trying to understand their relationship between my mum and my grandma because mum moved into this farmhouse and it was very much everything was done by grandma's rules and it was very traditional we did that that time of year and that's what you know this is how things run and mum was not going to shy away from owning her own space in that kitchen and it almost became a competitive marmalade making kind of scenario by the end of um a few years of her practicing to make it with grandma kind of keeping a watchful eye and yeah god it it wasn't easy for mum and I explored pieces of in the scenes memories that I had of finding out things along the way and I would that's how I've helped the reader find out things in the scenes and the stories um to discover that she didn't have a great time as a kid and she, her mum probably had undiagnosed depression. Um, my aunt died when my mum was six. Uh, she was 18 months old, meningitis. And it was so sad. And I, I think what I was wanting to do with this sharing these things was share that everybody has a a family history and a past and all sorts of stories there that sometimes don't get talked about an awful lot. Your mum didn't, they said, didn't tell you this, did she? Not much, no. Not you found out that was a great deal later. Older, yes. Mm. And I knew I could piece together bits of the jigsaw puzzle in my mind from different situations, but it wasn't something we talked about very openly. Um, I think she was put in her past in the past and moving on and making a home and a family and a life. And in a busy farmhouse, there isn't much time to pause and reflect and stop and have longer conversations. It's very much you're doing the doing. Um, but through writing it, I was able to kind of work out where I was in all of this and understand why maybe my teenage years had been a bit more angst ridden and why, why we reacted in certain situations to each other like we had. Um, and then sort of, as I had a, our first baby and then subsequently we've got four children now, mum has been there every single step of the way and helped me immensely. And I wanted to honor that with the book really and say, gosh, where would we be without our families around us or our communities or our village to raise children? And I'm so, so lucky that I've had that. We moved back to, to the farm and to carry on the farm, um, but we've been surrounded by family the whole time to pitch in. And I, I just get so frustrated with modern life that wants to celebrate an individual all the time when it really isn't an individual that does anything on their own. It's a, it's a team, whatever that looks like, whether it's a group of friends living together in a student house or it's looking after each other and cooking and caring, cleaning, all the what are termed as mundane things. I think and historic the most acts. yes. They yeah. are the most important. So I will, all of that is kind of where I'm at with the book, that it it evolved through I didn't know that I was going to write the book that I wrote at the start. Um, I wanted to share stories and recipes of my life and I had plenty of going on but until I wrote started writing I didn't know what was there um and it's become very deep and personal and, and very honest one of my friends said she she said because people keep saying gosh it's really honest Helen it's really <laughs> wow wow in interviews wow it's so honest and my friend um said to me maybe people aren't used to women being so honest about how it feels and I not, thought that hit the nail on the head. You know, it's not necessarily really going head to head with those difficult parts. Kate, I, I wonder if I could ask you, I mean, that the stories that you tell, and I, I'd love it if you'd sort of 
shares. I mean, there are lots and lots of them, but but when the ones that you you know really strike you as particularly um, symbolic or meant a lot to you. But it it struck me that a lot of the time people's sense of home comes when they have begun to face up to some something that's niggling away at them, some kind of unresolved trauma or not knowing the path they want their life to take. I mean, I think that was probably true for you too, in terms of feeling that you had a home, you know, not feeling happy in the house that you've made beautiful, but still wasn't at home. So many people you talk to suffer kind of reversals in their lives, and then they somehow realise what it is that's important, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, when I was thinking about who, who I wanted to talk to, who would be able to, um, shed light on this you know on this sort of unknowable or this unanswerable question of of what makes a home um i you know i i wrote a lot i write a lot of lists um i have notebooks and uh, all those behind me here they're all the note there's like about 10 notebooks from from this book um so there's a lot of a, a lot of list making um and one of the things that um struck me is uh what it's like what it's like to lose a home how how you feel if you lose a home and how you make a home after something that is so deeply traumatic um and it's never happened to me i've never lost a home in that way i've moved around you know i lived in i lived in in rented flats there were times when I could have been booted out because I couldn't pay the rent but I got very very good at writing begging letters to my very understanding landlord so um uh he was kind enough to let me stay when he could very easily have hoiked me out uh because I couldn't pay my 50 quid a week um but the closest I came to losing uh my home was when I was quite small when I was about eight years old and um our house caught fire we had um Helen and I were comparing how cold our childhood homes were no one had really I mean she's uh, significantly younger than me I I will say so sorry Helen to kind of tie you with my 70s brush but um you know growing up in the 70s with very very inefficient kind of old um uh brick lined uh storage heaters that just did not do you remember no those? I mean, they just, they, I mean, they're completely useless. So we'd wake up with sort of ice on the inside of the windows and things. And my mum, who's, you know, an incredibly robust Yorkshire woman, except that she's always cold. And, um, and, and so she'd indulged in, you know, a 1970s electric blanket, which one night caught fire. Luckily, she wasn't in the bed, but uh, we had to be bundled. We had to be <laughs> bundled up in the dark. I mean, I remember it as, of course, a huge adventure because, like Helen said, we had this amazing community around us, these wonderful neighbours who didn't blink when we turned up on the doorstep at sort of whatever time it was, 11.30 at night in the pitch dark on a winter's, on a winter's evening with, you know, there was me and my brother and the cat <laughs> and mum uh, saying, oh, house is on fire. And they just, you know, made us a camp in their sitting room and made hot chocolate and, and the fire brigade came and chucked the burning mattress out of the window and, and the house was saved although it smelt of, of, of wet soot, which is a, a smell now that takes me right back there every time. But I did mm. interview an extraordinary uh, brother and sister in the Shetland Islands who had mm. lived in their croft since they were, well, they have been born in the croft. And um, what was interesting, I think, about their story and others who'd left, left, lost their homes too, ownership doesn't seem to matter. Um, and, you know, they were tenants in this croft, or their parents were, so their parents moved into the croft in 1922, um, and, uh, you know, both children obviously had grown up there. Uh, Ruby had left, um, when she left school, she went and trained to be a teacher, so she actually left Shetland, but Willie spent his whole life working alongside his parents at the croft and then uh, when his father got ill Ruby came back and when they lost both their parents they carried on running the croft you know running their sheep growing their vegetables keeping their garden and then uh, in February 1922 uh, sorry 
2022, so 100 years after they had moved in and, and lived on that in that croft. Um, Willie woke up one morning, there was a tremendous storm raging around uh, uh, the islands. Shetland's fairly um, well known for its uh, dramatic weather. Um, and he woke up to this, you know, thunder and lightning crashing around and the smell of, he, he described it as a sort of hot wire smell. And he had a, an old radiator plugged into his room and he thought maybe the fuse was going or something. So he put on his, his trousers and his shirt and put his van, his truck keys into his pocket out of force of habit, walked downstairs and the fuse box was in the porch of the croft and it was on fire and it was dripping bits of burning plastic onto, I mean, all of us have got things in our porches that probably we shouldn't hold mops and <laughs> just bits of rubbish. They were all merrily catching fire as well. Ruby, his sister, was in her bedroom downstairs. He knocked on the door saying, you've got to get up, you've got to get up, you've got to get out. Um, and... Um, I mean, I won't tell the whole story. They did both get out, but the croft was lost. It was burnt entirely to the ground. And I met them only four months later. So it was a very, still a very, very raw, very emotional experience for them. Um, and it was really interesting to hear what they said about how they could find home again and how their community had done everything they could to, to help them find a home and to help them um, pick up their, their lives again. But what was, what was so astonishing was, you know, these are very practical people, farmers tend to be, they have to be. And, and Ruby, you know, Willie, Willie was saying, I do really miss the, the books and the photographs, you know, those, those irreplaceable, family memories really tangible family memories and Ruby said yes but Willie if our parents had still been alive what would they be what would they be worrying about what would they care about all they would care about is that we survived that we've got each other we are each other's home and I thought that was so illuminating and moving and yeah. dignified um, and and, you know, everybody I spoke to who lost their homes, uh, a woman, a woman who lost her home through bankruptcy, through no fault of her own, um, two extraordinary refugee women, one from Ukraine, um, one from Syria, whose life, you know, she didn't just lose her home, she lost everything, her language, her community, her culture, her country. And, um, and yet, there is something, as you said right at the beginning, Alex, something that people can carry with them to that is it is like it is like the little seed. It's like people, you know, it's like those old stories of nomads carrying a, a handful of seeds with them um, or Jack in the Beanstalk uh, and planting that seed and recreating, rerouting. I suppose it is literally that it is rerouting. Re yes. Yeah. There were, I must say. Talk about resilience. Ruby also says something, I think, in the book, like, well, thank God I'd had my hip done or I wouldn't have got out of the window. And I just thought, that's such a good joke. I and know. that's not really true. Quite I mean, literally. true, but wow. You, I know. So, so Willie's banging on her bedroom door saying, you've got to get out. He's then, you know, gets the front door open and is pulling out all this sort of burning detritus from the porch, but the whole place is full of smoke. So Ruby described opening her bedroom door to a wall of smoke and knew she couldn't get out. And she's, bless her heart, she's in her pajamas with a jumper on over the top of them. She has got her glasses on. And then when Willie's going, where is she, where is she? And he suddenly hears her and she's banging on the window, her bedroom window, um, and he goes round and helps her open it. And she says, <laughs> I did manage to climb out, but only because I'd had my hip done. Should have had my hip done. I would have never have got out. Um, I mean, <laughs> it's an incredible piece in the book. It's absolutely beautiful to think about them just holding together and just surviving that, and and thinking about their home and that view that he talks about. He misses the view, doesn't he, of yeah. looking out? But they've got each other, and that's 
that's always been something really close to my heart for you know our family just James and I even though we yearn to come back here wherever we've been in whatever house we've had and we've had several home has been us together just yeah. yes and that's so it really speaks to me and it this same about your other couple in Shetland is it Willie and another Willie another <laughs> Willie, yeah. another Willie yeah. and Jacqueline and, yes and that was lovely to read about them it never crossed their minds to question why they felt so at home here because it just it just is yeah. um and it got me thinking after our conversation this morning briefly Kate just thinking about what was my relationship with home um I love it here when I can uh, open the door and walk across it. I'm so, so lucky to have this beautiful scenery around me. But it wouldn't mean a jot if I wasn't with James and the children. It just yeah. wouldn't, it, it wouldn't matter if, uh, oh, it, it really was remarkable reading your stories. And it particularly with, with the refugees coming across, from, was it this Syrian story you mentioned about the food and when you walked in and the, they were, um, I was thinking about like how families bring their culture with them with the recipes that they've got and they you're in that home and and it smells of another place because they're cooking that, that those foods um so food has always been central to me and if you can put a meal on the table everybody feels at home eating. exactly and um you know it, it's interesting one of the um, one of the things that we've um, we've got questions just flooding in so many questions a lot of them are about food I mean and they are questions about when you both learned to cook about how important it is that we put food at the heart of our lives and yet we have pretty poor diets many of us and we they are perhaps too well they are too heavily reliant on processed food and food that we don't know the origin of. And we've got loads of questions on that on that topic. So I think we should probably spend a, a little bit of time on it. I mean, Helen, you know, your book is full of recipes and an awful lot of things that I'm going to be completely truthful are not like marmalade, like scones, all sorts of things that I, I wouldn't make from scratch, even though I like to cook, um, but I'm not a great baker. Um, but you are very, very honest about, you know, there are addendums to the book saying, this is what you can do if you're in a hurry. This is what you can do if somebody's sick. This is what you can And it is baked beans or tin soup or whatever. And you're saying, yes, try to make a lovely fresh soup, but you don't always have to. So both of you talk to me and talk to us about, about food. Why don't we start oh. with these recipes go throughout, don't they? Thanks, Alex. I... Um... How did I learn to cook? It was one of the questions, wasn't it? So I watched an awful lot of Ready Steady Cook when I was growing up. I used to come in from school. It was on in the kitchen. Mum would be down in the garden somewhere because she had had a day already. So she'd need to escape. And I didn't understand how much she needed her garden until I was much older. And I need a walk now and again to top myself up. Um, so she would be down doing that and I would be in the house hungry from school because I'd take a packed lunch because I didn't really like the school dinners so I'd had a fairly light, like light lunch I needed something I was ready for a meal and I used to raid the pantry and go in and see what I could find and do a version of ready steady cook and I just laid out the things that I could make. <laughs> and I basically watched an awful lot of Nigella and Nigel Slater um and I just experimented, but it wasn't till I was um, maybe oh, went to France and tried, I was stayed in a French family for two weeks and I thought I was going to help teach English in the French school as part of my work experience. But what I really was doing was tasting all the different food at lunchtime. That was the highlight of the day because their school dinners were insanely good and I can still dream about them now. Um, and all those crunchy French baguettes and dipping into the sauces and oh, the vegetables and the green beans and the tasty tomatoes and oh, meat dripping in tasty juices and all sorts of things. I loved it. And that sort of sparked me off on 
eating it and enjoying it, watching it on TV and wanting to improve. And I just basically just taught myself. I am no great cook. I am a home cook who loves food. I love to eat. Uh, my family loves to eat. And I love to know where it's coming from. Um, because like when you're making it, with baking especially, you know what ingredients are going in it, don't you? Let's be honest. Um, you look at the packets now and they're so full of enums and all sorts of things. And it's a real challenge as a mum of four to do this. Like I, I'm not perfect by any shape or form because they want to pile the trolley with all sorts of things if we're out shopping together. And I'm like, let's try and make this and try and make that. Now our eldest is, is a chef in a local restaurant and she's, she gets frustrated with me if I say, let's cut the corners and get something. And she's like, no, we can make that mum. So she she's pushing me now. Oh, so which it's is history sort of repeats itself a bit. Kate, Very um, much Kate so. are you a are you a cook? Yeah, I I um I I love I love cooking. I mean, part of it, uh, again, when you live in a rural area, you know, we we couldn't get a takeaway. There is no, you know, there's no delivery service no around delivery. here. Um, you know, so uh, and but also I I think like Helen, um, you know, I come from uh, I come from a background where. Um, the, the, as I say, there weren't the ready, you know, if you were born in 1968, as I was, and brought up in the 70s in the countryside, um, and brought up with a family that held its family values very strongly, and those family values were built around eating together. I didn't go to a restaurant until I was probably 15, I think. I think that was the first time I ate out you, we just didn't eat out why I mean it was a, it was sort of seen as a it was a waste of money really why why would you do that I mean I think mum probably would have loved it if we ate out a bit more and and you know the occasional the occasional treat for her was that me and dad would go to the local town which was you know it, was, it wasn't miles and miles away but it was sort of probably six miles away and get fish and chips and then and and again that's another thing that I there's a smell that takes me back because you did get it properly wrapped in newspaper in those days no one cared about newsprint on their cod and um you'd have it so I'd have the parcel this lovely warm slightly soggy you know heavy reassuringly heavy parcel on my knee and we'd drive it home and it would never quite be hot enough but it didn't matter you know it was this tremendous treat of fried food we never had fried food but mum did cook and it wasn't it wasn't fancy food at all. It was, you know, it was, as Helen said, it was good home cooking. We had a lot of, you know, we had shepherd's pies and we had crumbles and we had, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was stews, lots of stews and, but it was, it was, it was what was in season because that was what you could get. You know, there weren't uh, things like, you know, people think now they have to feed their children avocados and sweet potatoes. I think, I mean, I'd, again, I was about, 20 I think when I had an avocado for the first time also thought it was disgusting took me a while to grow into those <laughs> um but you know we ate we ate locally and seasonally because that was the only choice and we ate around the table you know again in the 70s growing up and in the countryside it was perfectly normal and acceptable for you to be kind of chucked outside and not come in until it's dark. Um, and, uh, but, but mum and I, mum, she taught me to cook. I mean, it was sort of, it wasn't a kind of, I didn't beg to be taught, but it was also something that you just sort of did. Um, and actually, I suppose going back to, to, to my first observation of your book, Helen, of, of, you know, women, it being very much that kind of woman's role of homemaking is, you know, food is so intrinsically linked to that. So it was almost this thing of mum would cook and it was sort of accepted that I would be alongside her kind mm. of mashing the potato for the shepherd's pie or, um, or, you know, peeling the carrots or whatever, whatever it was. And so, I I learned to cook and loved it. My grandfather, I remember for my 10th birthday, gave me a wonderful cookbook and there may be people old enough out there to remember it. I can't remember what it was called, but it had this brilliant picture of a 
dog on the front, a, you know, a cartoon of a dog on the front cover with a bandage around its nose because it had eaten food that was too hot or something, something like that. Anyway, and it had all sorts of, you know, recipes like fudge in it. Um, but for me, very early on, I realised the, the potency of of food, of, of what it can achieve, of, of how it can make people feel. And it's always been, it's always been my default, you know, um, as someone who, who never wanted children. Um, and uh, when friends had, were having children, my default wasn't to go out and buy them, you know, pretty pink baby grows, because I knew everyone else would do that. I just made a lot of things for the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just, just, you know I just thought food is food is the thing that kind of can just keep people going in whatever the circumstances yes exactly can we uh, you, I don't want us to, to run out of time before we talk about and obviously it's so linked um intrinsically linked about farming and we are of course a lot of people are asking that kind of question and uh, Rosie for example says do you think farming is under great pressure now as the subsidy system is changing to the environment land management scheme, a lot of farmers saying they won't be able to manage. And yet we've also got to think about future sustainability. Um, well, I'd like you both to, to talk about that. It's something you write a lot about, Helen, in, in your book. There's, yeah, there's huge challenges for farming in this country. And what are we doing when we don't value the food that from the land and good land stewardship? I, I think it, it drives me wild that we don't have adequate government support and recognition for what farmers are we're asked to do um, because we're being undercut by cheap imports coming in, that food is produced to substandard of what our welfare regulations are in this country and it's on our shelves. You can go to any supermarket, you can pick up a chicken sandwich and have a look on the back, packet, back of the packet. It's usually chicken from Thailand. And that's in Morrison's and Sainsbury's. It's, it's absolutely absurd what's going on with food and farming in this country. Um, the BPS system, for however it, it worked and didn't work, it was a system. And now we haven't really got an understanding, a clear understanding of how we're supporting farmers properly. Elms, there's oh, stewardship schemes, and farmers aren't, the, the, the paperwork is absurd and the regulations are and, you know, we need healthy, nutritious food grown in the country to, to provide good nutrition for the population. And it drives me crazy to think about it, um, how, how, what a mess we're in, an absolute mess. We've got stuff on the shelves from all over the world coming in um, uh, when the blueberry bushes are being ripped up in Scotland because farmers can't make enough money with the blueberries. Orchards down the country are not going to produce anymore because they're not getting the right price. It's dairy farms going out of business every, every week. There's so much wrong, isn't there? And we need education and we need to share good messages about food and farming. This is not like basic access to healthy vegetables, meat, dairy, isn't a, shouldn't be a luxury or a privilege. It should be, a, it's a basic human right. So it gets me hey. really, really cross. But Helen, I think- uh, I'm only it, jumping in because I can tell you're cross and I can also tell you're right to me. Helen and I were, were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier. And, um, and, and one of the things that, that you know I said to Helen and 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 I you know I I have a farm and work on a farm but my living doesn't come from the farm so I come from this from an entirely different perspective that Helen and James does um, but nonetheless you know one of the things that Helen and I would were were kind of bemoaning and kind of in in comprehending about earlier was you know uh, I confess that I am possibly the worst businesswoman in the world. I have no idea how to how to run a business or, or work a business. I'm not I'm not wired that way or, or driven that way. But it seems to me that if a business is to be successful, you need to produce or make something that everybody wants and needs. And everybody needs food. 
So why is it that the people who produce food can't make a living from that? And it seems to me, and I, re I, I don't know whether this is, this is right, Helen, but it seems to me that one of the biggest issues is that the price of food, of food has become politicized. So mm -hmm. it's become a vote winner. How cheap can we make food? You know, everyone worries when the price of food goes up or, or governments do and politicians do, they worry when the price of food goes up because they think that it basically is going to be a vote loser for them. And food shouldn't be politicized. Food is the absolute bedrock of mm -hmm. our health and our existence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we go back to your mum or certainly our grandmother's generation the amount of a family's income that was spent on food was something like 25 percent I think and now it's less than 10 percent and 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 I and and you know it's not about cost of living we know that there are a lot of people out there struggling to meet the costs of living but we my mum brought me up and I suspect you were the same, you're brought up with a set of priorities. And those priorities are you pay for the things that really matter. And if you've got anything extra, then you can have, you know, a new jumper or a new pair of jeans. Um, I wrote a tweet once. I don't do Twitter anymore because I think it's a bit toxic and, and I don't like it. But um, the proudest tweet I ever wrote was when there was uh, a story about the price of milk. Um, going down you know the fighting over a price of a pint of milk and I know like you do plenty of dairy farmers who've gone out of business who simply cannot make ends meet anymore because the price of milk had gone down to something like 12p a litre and mm -hmm. um and and you know this whole thing of people not being willing to pay the proper price for milk but getting their vaginas bejazzled which they would pay for and that's what I don't on what sort of priority is that you know we'll for jazzle but we won't pay the proper price for a pint of milk and I went today sorry this is all getting a little bit heavy but I went today uh, for a routine breast screening what a privilege that we have that offered to us for free and yeah. um, but I'm also of an age where a lot of my friends are being diagnosed with cancer and it's terrifying and I said to the amazing nurse on duty who did my scan I said why is that is it because of you is it because you're picking up things earlier because there are these amazing screening services that that allow diagnosis to happen more frequently and she said yes that's part of it but she said diet is unquestionably another part of why cancer is becoming more and more frequent. We're eating more processed foods and ultra processed foods. We're eating a bad diet and that is being reflected in our health. Yeah, we just don't know what these foods are doing to us. We know enough now to know to avoid them and that they're bad for us, but we don't know exactly what they're doing to our gut microbiomes, do we? And all our health, Inf inflammation is one of the worst things, isn't it? And various cancers and such like. And it, I mean, gosh, it's it's great to hear you had that routine mammogram and, and screening and checks. I'm just flabbergasted at the moment that there's so many different sectors of, of people striking, there's nurses, there's and doctors, and there's so many problems with the world that it just, I get so frustrated that the people that are doing the caring jobs and the, the, the school teachers, you know, the stress that everybody's under. No wonder we haven't got time to look up and say, oh gosh, we need a breather from this. What, what could make this better? Because everybody's heads down and working because their mortgages are so high and their, their rents are so high, their electricity and gas is so high. And then it comes down to food, doesn't it? And then the very thing that would sustain us and build healthy relationships around the kitchen tables and all of that just goes because everybody's just so pressed for time yeah and I've sort of written against that with my book so it might look very bucolic and and pretty on the outside but I've got a message in there that's that's with heart and soul that I think we're getting too far away from some of the things that matter and I absolutely like I thoroughly enjoyed this over the weekend, Kate, because it just reminded me of 
all different people's struggles to find home and feel safe and feel loved and um to just to just be kind to each other I think one of the chapters you finished with kindness was the most important yes, thing that's absolutely right that 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 is a chapter about somebody who's been displaced from their home too and it's incredibly moving listen we are about to run out of time however yeah, that's gone quick I, I I know I would agree uh, with you absolutely Helen and say so that one of the things that's come across so strongly uh, from both of your books is there are actually many 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 ways to make a home and not and no home will be made without some teething issues and some little root diversions um and finally then on to my home now you've both been very 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 good at telling other people, you know, at showing other people what you do in your properties and your farms and on your land to make them work. So how do I make my boggy field in the south of Ireland with absolutely no expertise and skill? I've got a bit of time. What do I do? You're you on the spot now. First, you need to give it lots of rest and you need to check I would say give it some rest and get a botanist and see what's there and then see what you want from the land. Do you want to grow things? Do you want to graze animals on there? Do you want to, you know, because leaving it to go completely wild and abandoned is one thing, but then to increase lots of different plant species, I get something grazing on there. Um, it can do world of wonders uh, for your plant diversity. I certainly would be interested in you putting some sheep on there. It depends what size of acreage it is. There's options of planting some trees and putting some cages in there and, and then working with nature and, and seeing what you... You have to have a bit of a vision for what you want from it, really. Well, I want it to look lovely and be good for everything. You know, I think, I think if, Kate, it's, if, it's, if it's a boggy piece of land, one of the one of the things and um, the other thing that we have to remember is that farmers are often criticised for something that absolutely isn't their fault, that is government policy, uh, which is imposed at a time where it's felt like it's the sensible thing. So one thing that happened post Second World War, when, of course, there was an enormous pressure to uh, make land as productive as possible, was to drain boggy areas um, and to fill in ditches and to uh, and to make everything grazing land. Now, we're paying for that now because, uh, you know, if you drain ditches and drain bogs, there's nowhere for water to go. And that's why we're seeing increased flooding as we get more dramatic weather events as our climate starts to change. So if you have got a boggy piece of ground, that is a treasure and you need to completely celebrate <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this to you Alex celebrate your bog um because I love it thank you it, it is you know that is an increasingly rare um and valuable habitat um it, Helen I is have... absolutely right um I would get a botanist in to see yes. what you've got there Great. I would talk to an organisation like the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust, who love advising people on what they can do to create uh, a wetland. Grazing, as um, Helen says, can be very valuable so, and, and look at native breeds don't go don't go you know for your your big your big expensive uh kind of continental breeds you want you know a nice a nice sort of highland cow or a belted galloway or a you know a good native southern irish sheep will come in and you don't want to graze it too hard you just graze you graze in bits but someone will advise you on that and they don't have to be your animals because you know that's a whole heap of other <laughs> stress that you would give yourself but but, you know, you will find lovely livestock uh, people, I'm sure, in your area who will happily put their animals on your land uh, for the time that you need it there. But all I would say is if you've got a bog, love it, celebrate it and make it count. Wow. Thank you. You've made me feel so much better about, <laughs> about, the, about my wellies. Thank you so much. Listen, guys, you've been so brilliant. You've just been so brilliant. And thank you all for all your questions. I know Jack is going to 
going to come back now and and say uh, say goodbye to us all. At least I think he is. Yes, here he is. Um, but you've just been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Alex. You, Alex. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much, Kate and Helen. That was a wonderful conversation, and and so we went quite. We went to a lot of spaces, didn't we? Jeff? Yes. We did yeah, covered a, covered a lot of ground. Exactly. Covered a lot of ground. But you know, we it ended with my personal question time. But what ended we do? with a celebration of bogs, which it felt apt, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you yeah thank you so much you could have listened to it for for many more hours and and thank you Alex for sharing so brilliantly and thank you all for watching at home as well um remember that you can find details about how to order Kate and Helen's books in the chat they're being posted right now from you and bookshop our wonderful independent book selling partner uh please do keep your eyes peeled for future fiber 15 events next Monday the 9th of October we have Marcus de Sorto and Alex Bellos discussing the maths behind games Games should be a really fun one so do tune in for that thank you so much Kate Helen and Alex for this evening and thank you all for watching good night thank, thank you thanks everybody thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.